You're listening to Dakota Spotlight. My name is James Wallner. This is Episode 7 of Unresolved, The Murder of Joel Loveling. This is the last scheduled episode of Season 7. If something new breaks in this story or case, I'll be back with an update. If you've not listened to Episodes 1 through 6, you'll want to start there first. In this episode, we'll meet three people. First, we will meet Travis Stay's defense attorney, Peter Wold. We will also meet Heather Kina. Heather was on that party bus that night, and she was John DeZeal's girlfriend. John was the clown. The couple married in 2014 and were later divorced. We will also talk to Sergeant Subi of the Grand Forks PD. Sergeant Subi is the detective currently responsible for Joel Loveling's case file. That and more coming up in this episode of Unresolved, The Murder of Joel Loveling. There was an energy around it, unlike any case I had ever covered, unlike any case I've covered since. Late in the evening hours of October 27th, and it was a a confusing scene. And there was a certain bizarreness to the case created by the Halloween atmosphere that night. And my my first thoughts, it was just so unfair because everything was going so right in Joel's life at that time. Both sides had their theories about what happened. So when they got to the broken drum, everybody got off the bus. Uh, He had the victim's blood on his clothes. Body of the sweatshirt, the arm of the sweatshirt, the costume piece that was in the garbage, his pants. Most of the people, I think, went out one door and got on the bus. And I even felt it could have, it should have been me, not him. Maybe that's the big sister talking. Before we dive into the interviews, there are a few things I'd like to address. To begin with, I'll just be very straightforward and honest. This season, this case, has me feeling a bit frustrated and unsatisfied. I started out in episode one stating how I hope that by approaching this story with a facts first and entertainment second mindset, somehow we might gain a better understanding of this story and get closer to a sense of the truth. And I have heard from some of you who feel that that has been achieved. Many of us now have a deeper and wider understanding of this case. But I'm feeling a bit unsatisfied anyway, and I think I know why. This is one of those cases where it certainly feels like the truth has made its great escape and just cannot be captured. It feels like the truth is just gone. And at the same time, so many people seem certain of what must have happened or could not have happened in that parking lot in 2007. But before I say another word, I'll say out loud what you may be thinking. So what, James? You're frustrated and unsatisfied? Welcome to the murder of Joel Loveling. And that's true. I immediately think of Joel Loveling's family, his friends, and co-workers. They are the ones who lost a loved one. My frustration cannot compare to what they have gone through. But there are others, too, others who have been dealing with this sense of frustration for 15 years. It seems like no matter who you are in this story, you lose. But I will also say this, while the people I've interviewed for this season may be divided on many things, while they have opposing theories of what happened to Joel and how it happened, they also share one common sentiment. And so, please allow me now to bundle up that sentiment And on behalf of everyone I've interviewed, I'll say to Joel Loveling's family, friends, and loved ones, we are just so sorry for your loss. Before we get into the interviews, I want to touch on a couple of things I've been meaning to get to, which will also give context to today's episode. Way back in episode two, I told you that investigators had received some inaccurate witness statements, proven to be inaccurate by watching the security video from inside the Broken Drum bar. One of those witness statements was made by a couple who had been playing pool at the Broken Drum that night. They told police that they saw Joel Loveling in an argument with the clown, that is, John DeZeal, and his girlfriend Heather, whom we will be meeting in a minute. They told police that Joel, the clown, and a woman walked out the back door together just before Joel was found dead. 
That is not accurate. Joel walked out the back door, and it's clear from the security video that John Dezeal, the clown, and Heather walked out the front door about three minutes later. In fact, it is this moment of the security video when the clown and Heather leave the broken drum to get on the bus some three minutes after Joel went outside that will prove in court that the bus and its many passengers must have still been in the parking lot when Joel left. There's another thing I want to explain for context. As we know, Travis Stay took a wild swing at James Wavra and missed. James Wavra quickly punched Travis and then continued to the waiting party bus. After this scuffle, three of the bus passengers walked back over to where Travis was, nursing a bloody nose. These three young men were Bryce Larson and two of his friends, Mitch Dolan and Josh Dezeal. The trio told investigators later that they had simply wanted to see who was in a fight with James Wavra. One of the three actually stated to police they were going to walk over there and, quote, give the guy some grief, unquote. According to their statements, when they walked back some 30 feet to where the fight had been, Travis was talking to Joel Loveling, that is, the man in the green hockey jersey. They asked Joel if the man in yellow was with him. Joel said, nope, I don't know him. Well, he's your problem now, they told Joel. He's off the bus. Something of that nature. The three men claimed that they then got back on the bus. There was no fight at that point. Last thing they knew, the man in yellow was talking to the man in green. They testified to this under oath at the trial. One of these individuals was Mitch Dolan. As I read through the 1,500 pages of documents in this case, there was one thing that was bothering me, something I couldn't quite shake. I kept telling myself, you must have missed it, because the alternative couldn't be true, I thought. What was bothering me was this. I found documentation that police had interviewed Mitch Dolan six months later over the phone, but I couldn't find what I was looking for, what I was calling the original interview with Mitch Dolan, the one they must have done that night or the next day or that first week. Well, as it turns out, the reason I couldn't find it wasn't because it was hidden in those 1,500 pages somewhere. It's because they apparently never did interview him originally. That is, not until six months later over the phone. And of course, the reason this bothered me so much is because Mitch Dolan was such an important witness. Again, he is one of three men who walked over to reportedly give the man in yellow some grief. And somehow, he wasn't even spoken to for six months. As I said, I thought I just must be wrong about this, but last week I understood it was true. Peter Wald, Travis Stay's attorney, whom we will now meet, sent me a portion of the trial transcript. And sure enough, right there in the transcript, as Mr. Wald is cross-examining the lead detective, he brings up this very point. How could you not have interviewed this person right away? I wanted to share this because it helps us to understand the defense's theory a little better. They didn't just prove that the bus and its passengers were still in the parking lot when Joel left the bar. Some of those passengers had a face-to-face -face conversation with Joel Loveling. And the defense suggested it was much more than just a conversation. Now let's meet Peter Wold, Travis Stay's defense attorney. I need to note one thing here, though. Peter Wold has had the advantage, you might call it, of listening to the podcast before speaking with me. He's heard Nancy Yon's views on the trial, for example. That is an advantage that Nancy Yon did not have, so to speak. So at the end of this interview with Mr. Wold, I'm going to play a couple of comments that Nancy made to me previously when I met with her in Grand Forks. Comments that I feel are balancing counterpoints, I guess, to this interview with Peter Wold. I finally caught up with him last week on the phone. You know, my grandfather, my grandfather was a lawyer in Botno, and, uh, you know, I went to his office a lot. I saw people coming in. So I guess I always thought I was going to be a lawyer. He attended North Dakota State University and then the University of Minnesota Law School. He's still practicing, and he's licensed in Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota. The main point Peter Wold wanted us to consider is why Travis was a main suspect in the first place. 
and the timing of when the bus left the broken drum was key to that, he says. According to Wold, when law enforcement arrested Travis Day, they truly believed the bus had already left the broken drum when Joel left the bar. This was proven to be inaccurate by studying that surveillance video. John Dezeal and Heather Holter leave the bar three minutes after Joel. They left on the bus, so the bus could not have left when Joel walked outside. Simple, and yet, according to Peter Wold, the investigators missed it. I asked Peter Wold who did bring this to the prosecution's attention. We did. We did. I mean, we went to, to trial. They, you never would have heard of it if, if we hadn't uh, uh, brought it up. But Peter Wall doesn't suggest that Travis' innocence comes down to the timeline exactly. It's bigger than that for him. His viewpoint is that because they thought the bus had left, investigators got tunnel vision. They got off on the wrong foot from the beginning, kind of like taking the wrong exit off the interstate and ending up lost in the countryside. When they charged Travis Day, uh, uh, they were under the erroneous assumption that the bus had left before um, Joe Loveling was attacked. That was, at the time, the theory of uh, Detective Simon and the police department and the prosecution when Travis Day was charged. Uh, They jumped to that conclusion, and it was a false assumption. We do it all the time. It's human nature to jump to conclusions. But but police investigators shouldn't, shouldn't jump to conclusions. And in the trial, while being cross-examined by Wold, the lead detective, Dwayne Simon, acknowledged this error in their thinking. After all, it was proven in the security video. And, and Simon's a good cop. I, I, he's an honest, I think, excellent, excellent cop. And uh, he, um, I mean, he just admitted. I, he says, I didn't look at the video that extensively. That was his answer. And then, of course, there was that interaction, whatever it was, when the three bus passengers walked over to, quote, give Travis some grief, unquote. That a fact beyond dispute was uh, that Josh Dezeal, Bryce Larson, and Mitch Dolan, at least the three of them, had a face-to-face confrontation with Joe Loveling and Travis Stay in the parking lot, and that was after Travis Stay had been pummeled by Mr. Wavra, and Joe Loveling had gone out to be a good Samaritan to check on Travis Stay. As you heard here, Peter Wald said that Travis was pummeled by Wavra. I feel like that's a strong word. The defense never disputed that Travis Stay took a wild swing at Wabra and later at Stephen Rossica in that alley. They never disputed that Travis had Joel's blood on him. They simply argued that none of that adds up to murder or guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. This guy that could uh, barely stand up and certainly couldn't walk a straight line took a couple of swings we know about, one at Wabra. And, and one at uh, Rizika, uh an hour or two later and ended up on the ground because he's, he's, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't hit anything. I mean, so, so they ask you to guess. Uh, so, yeah, he could have, Joe looked away and he landed a sucker punch. Or, yeah, right, right. Or Joe, uh, or he kicked him in the balls and, and uh, he fell down. I mean, I mean, can you imagine how you heard uh, this guy that swings and lands on the ground because he's he's so intoxicated, tried to kick somebody? Um, uh, it, you know, lots of luck. Peter Wald expresses his strong respect for the Grand Forks PD, for Nancy Yawn, and the state's attorney's office. But, he says, the Travis State trial wasn't even close. It, it wasn't a close call. And he heard that after the case was over from the jurors. They, 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 this wasn't a, he, they didn't prove it. They found him innocent, basically, uh, was their answer. And, and that was, those are the people that saw these witnesses, saw the East Grand Forks crew tell their quote unquote story 
in the courtroom, and um, and it, it it and you saw the response. It, it wasn't a close call here. I will note here that Travis Day was offered an opportunity to speak with us on Dakota Spotlight. As Peter Wald explains here, Travis is doing his best to move on. Travis Day is an innocent man, uh, had his life on the line based on erroneous assumptions made in this case. This, this hangs over Travis all the time, and uh, but... He's moved on. He's moved on well. He's got a, a great young family, uh, a wife, and, and um, uh, young kids. He, uh, after uh, graduating from UND and going back to school and getting his degree, he uh, uh, went to law school. And he is a lawyer now. He clerked uh, for me while he was going to law school, and he's a public defender in Minnesota now. Um, and that's what he does. I want to thank Peter Wald for speaking with us. As I mentioned, I'm going to play a couple of comments from Nancy Yawn that are related to what we just heard. First of all, regarding the timing of the bus, while the defense did prove that the bus was still at the broken drum when Joel left the bar, that only proves that the cowboy and others had the opportunity to be involved in a beating of Joel. We weren't married to the timeline. What was important to us was the fact that everyone that was accounted for on the bus made it downtown other than Travis Stay. And the last people seen in the parking lot together were Travis and Joel. And finally, again, just in the spirit of allowing both sides of this story to be told, here is Nancy's response to me when I asked her the following. What would she say to those who feel so confident that Bryce Larson, the cowboy, and others on the bus killed Joel Loveling? I guess I would just say, what do you base that on? What evidence was there that Bryce Larson killed Joel Loveling? Other than he was difficult with law enforcement. Yeah, he wasn't involved in fights that night. He didn't have blood on him. He didn't have abrasions on him. We'll be right back after this short break. If you like what you hear on Dakota Spotlight, consider supporting it with a subscription to the forum. Get unlimited access to daily news, weather, and sports coverage for just 99 cents a month for your first three months. Visit inforum.news slash join right now to subscribe. That's inforum.news slash join. Welcome back to Unresolved, the murder of Joel Loveling. Let's meet Heather Kina. In 2007, she was Heather Holter, and she was on that party bus. Her boyfriend, John DeZeal, was dressed up as a clown. The couple argued that night, and John got pulled into the PD to be interviewed about a murder. They married in 2014 and were later divorced. Not only were you John... Uh, who was dressed as a clown that night. Girlfriend, you guys were married for a while, correct? Yes, we actually got married in 2014. John and I have since gotten divorced. Yeah, no, I really appreciate uh, this podcast. Is It's like you're going in depth and so much more facts than what's previously been stated. And I do appreciate your podcast because you do go in depth. and And it's great. And people that I know have said, oh, I didn't know that. I'm glad he's sharing that. That's really good that we're finding out about this. Now, last week, someone posted a question on the Dakota Spotlight Facebook group. Why would the party bus drop everyone off downtown and let them find their own way home? While I had Heather on the phone, I asked for clarification. We got dropped off um, at Slutsters, which was downtown. And to be honest, I'm not sure or never have been sure of what the routing of the bus was and never did know that. Um, So I guess when um, the police were running around downtown trying to find some um, witnesses, then it was in my understanding that the bus got taken by the police department. Yeah, but then I also think that that was our last stop. So how we were supposed to get back across 
to the cuckoo's nest where our vehicle was, I'm assuming we would have just walked. Heather recalls the confusion that night when they got downtown and heard that someone had died after a fight at the broken drum. Yeah, there was there was absolute so much confusion that night because there was actually two fights at the broken drum. And we only knew about the one with Jimmy Wavra and the man in yellow. Um, now we know that to be a Travis Day. So when you guys heard someone died after a fight, you thought what? Immediately, we thought that whoever Jimmy Wabra hit was this man in the yellow had, um, from his injuries, passed away. I'm sure you're aware. I mean, it's come to me anyway. There was a rumor um, that you, since your divorce, you have told someone, that's the guy, my ex-husband, that's the guy that killed Joel Loveling. I'm sure you've heard this or no. I did recently, yes. Okay. So what do you have to say about that? Uh, That is completely false. And since John and I have gotten divorced, I will, no matter what, always stick by him on this subject because I know he did not do what some of the people think he did. Heather doesn't like talking about this case that much, especially not Travis Day, but she did share her take on the size differential. The one thing I will say um, about Travis Day, because I don't like to talk about him that much, but I just found it and find it really funny that people think a small guy like Travis couldn't take out Joel. He was aggressive that night. He tried fighting multiple people and even picked a fight with a random guy in an alley. And he had blood all over him. So I can't say much about it. I'm not a lawyer, you know, but I just find it funny that So many people think he's innocent when the evidence points to him with the blood and his aggressiveness night. Each year around Halloween, Dateline airs their story about Joel's murder. And like clockwork, the harassment returns with new life. I would say ever since the night of the murder, we have been harassed and criticized. Many lives have actually been altered due to the false accusations, and I think it's so unfair, especially for Bryce and John. It's aggravating that any of these guys would be named suspects in this community, considering most of them were in the police station that night of the murder with zero blood, zero offensive or defensive wounds. You know, so it's it's just crazy. Like the, the Dateline episode left a lot of viewers with a lot of questions that so many have centered their understanding of this case on speculation and rumors is beyond frustrating. As I said at the top of this episode, it is human nature to want to get answers. This case is frustrating. People want to know what happened, and it appears that it's a common thing to do when we grab onto one theory and we have a hard time letting go of it. At least then we feel like we have something to believe in, something to hold on to. But having your own theory of what happened and actively going out and harassing people, that's something different. That's slipping into the realm of becoming a vigilante. So John and I got married in 2014 in the summer. Um, Somebody, whether it was a guest or an employee that worked at the Ramada or just someone that randomly came in, put a memorial of Joel at the ceremony. It was like an eight by a couple eight by ten framed pictures of him, his fiance and daughter. I think there might have been a, been a few candles, um, but my bridesmaids tried to get rid of it before I could see it. But I did end up seeing it right before I was walking down the aisle. Then on Sunday, when we opened gifts in front of our family, I opened one, and the card had a dying bride on it. And then inside was our wedding announce, wedding announcement from the Grand Forks Herald. And the gift was two framed 8 by 10 photos, like the exact duplicates from the wedding ceremony. So uh, we called the police right away. And then on Monday morning, we brought all the framed photos and the card to the Grand Forks Police Department to um, give our statements. And they also wanted the items for fingerprints. And so while we were in the police station, 
I remember looking at John and I said, what a great honeymoon. <laughs> and then we ended up having to call all of our friends to tell them that they cannot put their wedding announcements of their soon to be weddings in the paper as that's how the person found out exactly where our wedding was going to be held. And every time the Dateline, every time the Dateline episode airs, that left all everyone with so many questions and left facts out of everything. Every Halloween that it gets aired again, or I get phone calls, texts, social media messages, it's super frustrating. What does John say about all this, or how, how has this affected him? Yeah, so it's caused a lot of uneasiness and dejection with him. Um, I feel for him, like, on this subject, it's been, it's been hard. Are you friends with Bryce Larson? Oh, yep. Of course I am. Yep. Any insight into how it's affected him? Or what does he say about this? The same, probably the same as John. It's just, you know, we're, we're all tired. Yeah. So it's just, it's disheartening. And I mean, it's, it's from what we've been through seems very minor from what the Loveling family has gone through since this night. I mean, I really feel for them. They need justice. I want closure for them. They deserve that. And we all deserve it. It's just because like this whole case is awful all the way around. Like none of us deserved any of this. And it's just sad. The other day I made a call to the Grand Forks PD and spoke with Sergeant Subi. Here he is. Good morning, Sergeant Subi. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your role there? Yes, I am currently a sergeant with the Grand Forks Police Department, uh, currently assigned to our Criminal Investigations Bureau. And you are currently in charge of Joel Loveling's investigative file, is that correct? Yes, I have been in charge of looking into any new tips that come in with the Joel Loveling homicide, and I have since late fall of 2019. Well, actually, let's, let's start there. This is what I've been curious about. What is the official, if there is a status, so to speak, of this case? Because, you know, we hear words like cold, open, closed, active, open, but not, but inactive. I mean, how would you, or how do you categorize this case? Sure. So the case is officially labeled as inactive, and that just simply means that all leads have been exhausted and there are no further uh, investigative steps that can be taken. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the case is shoved over into a corner and nothing will ever be done with it again. It just does not meet the technical definition of a cold case uh, per our department policy. So how often do you get tips about this case? We get tips every so often. I would estimate probably every three to four months uh, a tip will come in. And typically the tips come in after like an episode of the Dateline series. Uh, typically we'll get get a few tips that come in after something airs on the case, whether that's in the local newspaper or um, on a cable television show. So you get a tip either email or phone call or something, someone writes it down for you. What do you do at that point? So first, we need to determine if it's a credible tip, and then we look into it a little bit further. Um, each tip that comes in will cross-reference uh, the information that's provided, and if the individual leaves their contact information, we'll just reach out to them directly to see if they have anything more that they would like to add uh, because sometimes they'll just send like a quick email or a tip uh, via the tip 411 app and they'll just give very vague uh, information. So what would you say is the most difficult part of following up on these leads and investigating this now, what, 14, 15 year old case? I would say the most difficult part is corroborating the information that's coming in. And I say that because a lot of the tips that we have seen uh, over the past several years have been based on hearsay, uh, rumors, or just pure speculation. 
Can you give us any example of the types of tips you've gotten and how you went about investigating it and what it resulted in? Yeah, so some of the uh, tips that we get, like I had mentioned, are third or fourth hand information. So somebody heard something from someone who heard it from another person. And we start with the last person that heard the information and work our way back towards the original source. Um, most of the time, by the time we get to that person that should have the firsthand information, um, it, the information has been misconstrued or something was missaid or misheard, and it just turns out to be uh, unconfirmed. We're not able to, to corroborate the information. And like I said before, a lot of that is just based on hearsay and rumors uh, or just pure speculation. Uh, we, we've had tips come in of people indicating that they were at the broken drum that night and they even gave specific locations inside the bar where they were sitting. And then when we go back and review video surveillance that was obtained from that evening, they're nowhere to be seen on the video. And then follow-up interviews reveal that they were never there. Um, and for one reason or the other, they made up that they were there that evening. I would like people to know that although this murder is not considered a cold case by definition, every new credible tip that comes in is investigated. And since I took over the case file in late 2019, um, there have been numerous tips that have come in that have been followed up on and investigated. Um, although most of those tips uh, have been unfounded, we still run with them as far as we can go, and we will continue to look into any new tips that the public provides. So if someone has some information or a tip they want to share with you, what should, what should they do? So there's a couple of different options that people have for reporting information to the Grand Forks Police Department. One of the most common ways and the easiest, in my opinion, is to go to the TIP 411 app. And you can report a tip anonymously, or you can put your name and contact information down. Um, and that's something that's monitored 24-7. And we get emails indicating that there's a new tip that has come in through that system or through that app. And then the other method is just calling in to the Grand Forks Police Department's non-emergency number, which is 701-787-8000. Sergeant Subi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks for reaching out. I'd like to thank everyone who took part in this season, especially Erica Loveling, Joel's sister, and everyone else who helped us learn more about Joel as a person. Our hearts go out to all of Joel Loveling's family, friends, and loved ones. And thank you, all of you who helped us in our attempts to unravel and understand what exactly was waiting for Joel Loveling when he returned into that dark parking lot in October of 2007. Thank you, Dwayne Simon, detective on the case. I, every day I feel bad for Joel's family and, and his daughter and and, and everybody who was involved with Joel, I feel awful for him. And Prosecutor Nancy Yawn again. My heart hurts for the family very much and um, wanting to, to have justice for the family and it being out of my control. And that's hard. That's a hard situation to be in when you can't control the outcome. And thank you to my colleague Archie Ingersoll, former reporter at the Grand Forks Herald, for being our eyes and ears inside the courtroom. Who knows what, what happened there, whether he encountered S S Travis Day or someone else. Um, at some point, he, he, we know he crossed paths with Stay, but under what circumstances, there, there are no witnesses. I want to leave you now with something special. You've heard it before, but I'd like to end this season with Erica Loveling's touching memory of a very special moment. Thank you so much for listening to Unresolved, The Murder of Joel Loveling.
after Joel passed away when we were all in Grand Forks together, well, Joel died wearing a UND hockey jersey. His fiancée, Heather, worked at the Alaris Center, and we went to a UND hockey game. We, we got into the building, and I'd never been there, and it was wonderful, and we all went and bought UND hats and jackets and gear. And then we went up to this kind of a VIP area because Heather worked there, and there, there was some arrangements had been made. So we had this kind of a nice area to ourselves. And because, you know, we had family, we had guests, we had friends that were all invited to join us. And it was more of another social hour than really watching a game of hockey, which on any other day of the week, I had been fixated on. <laughs> Well, yeah, the game was beginning. They did the anthem and all of that. And then the announcer said, we have a special group in the house tonight and made this announcement. And just everybody knew, but he said, you know, we recently had a tragedy here and one of our strongest, or he said, one of our Arden fans had, a, had we lost one of our fans and they put Joel up on the board. Then they, I had no idea, then they fired up the Spongebob Squarepants theme song and we all started laughing and then we started singing along and next thing you know, the people in the arena were singing along with us. It was just a fantastic moment. It was wonderful. We were all hugging and smiling and crying and singing along and, oh yeah. It was just, it was a moment. It was such a moment. Dakota Spotlight is a production of Forum Communications, researched, written, and produced by me, James Walner. I also do the sound editing. Our podcast network manager is Chris Kurzman. Madison Hunter, our social media specialist, and Jeremy Fugelberg, our editorial advisor. To see photographs, documents, security video, and other member-only content about this season, head over to either inforum.com slash unresolved or grandforksherald.com slash unresolved. Want to support the show? We are entirely funded by members of the Forum Communications Company. To become a member and support the show, go to inforum.com slash subscribe. Find more Dakota Spotlight at inforum.com slash Dakota Spotlight and check out the vault section for more true crime. Don't miss the awesome Dakota Spotlight Facebook group. To join, go to facebook.com slash groups slash Dakota Spotlight. Finally, some music this season was generously granted again by Wowza in Kalamazoo and Hand Turner. Check them out at wowzainkalamazoo.bandcamp.com and handturner.bandcamp.com. Once again, thank you so much for listening to Dakota Spotlight. I'll see you next time. Sweet.